invite you this morning to join me in this uh, morning's prayer preparation as we prepare to open our hearts to, see, to hear this word from God and so that it may bless us, encourage us, challenge us, inspire us, and move us. So together, on the screen. Lord, we have come to this place from a world of demands and schedules. We have sought hope and peace and have found them here. Now we seek the inner joy that only your presence can bring to our lives. Open our hearts and our spirits to your love. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give a hand of praise for our praise team this morning? Amen. I'm so glad that they sang Joy to the World. Because if they did not, I was going to sing it for you. So they saved you this morning. As you can imagine from the, the last two songs we just heard this morning, today we're going to be talking about joy. As we have lit the candle of joy this third Sunday of Advent. So I begin by asking you, are you joyful today? Are you joyful today? We are in the presence of God. We are gathered in this house of worship. We are with one another. It is a beautiful cold day outside, but yet the sun is shining. We have breath in our lungs that is plenty to give us a sense of joy. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am joyful today. Yes, yes. To everyone watching at home, we welcome you to Christ Fellowship, and we are joyful that you are here with us this day. Let me ask you this other question, though, on the flip side of of joy. And perhaps today you're going to hear this message and you may leave this place and perhaps it's the hope that you will think of joy differently than you ever have before. So if you're joyful today, praise God. But if we are in a place where maybe we are not as joyful as we feel we ought to be, then I ask, Have you chosen joy then today? Have you chosen joy today? Oftentimes, happiness and joy are considered one and the same. Yet, they are very different. Biblically, they are very different. Happiness oftentimes is what happens, things that happen to us. Things that we receive. Perhaps even things that we experience that brings happiness into our hearts. But see, joy is about what we then give. Joy is more of an action than it is a reception. Joy is what we choose to live out in our daily lives. Joy is what we offer to the world. Joy to the world. You see, church? So when I ask the question, are we joyful today? I'm not asking if you're happy. I pray you're happy. (laughs) But are you truly joyful? To be joyful, there is a deeper and a far more profound meaning behind what it means to be joyful. Many of us are joyful in the things that we get to do, such as our jobs, Especially if our jobs, and, and, I, and, I, and, and many of our jobs do, serve others. We find great joy in getting to raise our children. Amen? We find great joy in being married to our spouses. Amen? Right? We find great joy in giving. We find great joy in service. And most of all, we find great joy in in faith. In faith. Again, joy is far more profound than just being happy when things are going our way or sad when they are not going our way. And the other reality for us today is that joy is also not entirely based on our circumstances. Joy is not in, based on our current circumstances. I want us to hear that. How many of us have ever said, I am joyful when things in your life are going bad? 
See, that's where sometimes we'll mix joy and happiness together. As if our joy is solely based on where we find ourselves in our lives. But the reality is that joy does not know circumstance. Joy is not fed off of circumstance. But rather, joy is chosen. Joy is an attitude. An adopted attitude that we choose to put on every single day. As Psalm 118, 24 says, For this is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Other versions will say, this is the day the Lord has made, so we will rejoice and be glad in it. It's a choice. When we recognize the things of God before us, we choose to rejoice because of who He is. First. First. So have we chosen joy today? How many of you have ever experienced um, your children's selective hearing. <laughs> My five year old's getting really good at that. I'm learning. I'm learning about it as I grow, as I go. <clears throat> and, and perhaps, how many of you really enjoy your spouse's selective hearing? <laughs> or your family members, whoever it is, right? See, selective hearing, um, what it means is you hear what you want to hear and only when you want to, right? We have to be very careful that also at the same time, so even though I say we choose joy, joy cannot become also selective. All right? Joy cannot be selective. One of the things I, I, I see a lot, especially around the holidays, Christmas, which is a season of joy, and you see this in the movies, you see this on TV, and perhaps some of us have experienced this in our own personal lives. Perhaps a marriage is not going well. Things are falling apart. Conversations of separation or divorce may be coming up. But hold on. Christmas is coming. For the sake of the children, let's get through Christmas. We're going to use the joy of Christmas as a, as a mask. And then once Christmas passes, then we'll proceed. That's, that's a, an example of selective, selective joy. We use the joy of a season, again, perhaps such as, as Christmas, or, or a circumstance, as I have said, though. Joy does not know circumstance, but we'll use a certain circumstance to present ourselves as a joyful individual, perhaps just to, to get through a, a, an obstacle or a period or a time, or to present ourselves to others in such a way that everything is fine, so we won't cast worry or doubt or fear onto others, or onto our children, or onto our neighbors, or to our church community. And so we'll select joy only in ways and times that best suit us. We have to be careful when we're doing that. Selecting joy is something that is a daily choice. Again, regardless of the circumstance. My wife asked me to help clean the garage the other day, and I knew it was coming. Did I wake up with joy in my heart that day? Absolutely not. It was more like this. Today's my day off, though, you know? I don't want to... I don't want to do the job, and, and I don't want to go clean the garage. And so, you know, so we have those days too where it's like, how, how is it even possible to select joy? Or, you know, you have jury duty coming up, or you have a final examination coming up. You, you want me to have joy on those days as well? Selective joy. Selective joy. It's not what God wants for us. Joy is not something that is fleeting or something that is only for a moment like happiness may be. Because sometimes we'll go through periods of happiness in our life and then all of a sudden we'll go through periods of great sadness and grief and struggles and difficulties. And happiness will seem fleeting and it goes and comes. But the reality is that joy is not intended to be something that is fleeting or something that is only temporary. But rather joy is something that is supposed to be eternal. It's something that is supposed to be forever. 
Because you see the reality that joy, biblical, faith-based joy, is rooted in the hopes and the promises of what is to come because of who our God is. Joy allows us to wake up every morning to see beyond the flaws of ourselves, the flaws of those whom we live with, the flaws of our neighbors, the flaws of the world, because then we are able then to see of the hopes and the promises of the coming future that is in the name of Jesus Christ. That's where joy lives. That's what joy is. So again, get this in our hearts and brains today. Joy is not based on circumstance. And joy is not selective. Joy is daily. If we believe in who God is, then by His grace may we wake every day choosing joy above all. But how? Isaiah 12, verses 1 through 6. Isaiah, in this chapter, takes some notes from the psalmist. And he writes a psalm for us today. Wrote this psalm for the people of Israel about our response when we are to be delivered. He's talking to a people who are about to see the Babylonian Empire fall and the return to home was about to happen. So rejoice and be glad. For that day is coming. And so he's trying to instill this spirit of joy once again for what is to come. And so he shares this, this, uh, this, this psalm, this song of trust in God and rejoicing for us today. And this should be our response, not just for the moment or the circumstance, but for always. And so this is what it reads, verses 1 through 6. And these are beautiful words for us today. So why should we choose joy? This is why. Verse 1, you will say on that day, I thank you, Lord, though you were angry with me, your anger turned away and you comforted me. God is indeed my salvation. I will trust and I won't be afraid. Yah, the Lord is my strength and my shield. He has become my salvation. You will draw water with joy from the springs of salvation. And you will say on that day, this is what we will say. Thank the Lord. Call on God's name. Proclaim God's deeds among the peoples. Declare that God's name is exalted. Sing to the Lord who has done glorious things. Proclaim this throughout all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, city of Zion, because the Holy One of Israel is great among you. This is the word of God for the people of God. So on that day, the things that we hope in, the things that God has promised us, the salvation that is to come in the name of Jesus Christ, the hope of eternal life, the hope of Christ coming back again to deliver us from our current sin, from our current darkness, and to raise us up to where He is. It brings us into this place then where it, it, it calls us to rejoice. The first thing he says is, and this is why we should always rejoice, because God is good, God is gracious. He goes, says, I thank you, Lord. Though you were angry with me, your anger turned away. There are things in our lives we know that we have done. If we were to stop there, stop in, in, in those circumstances a moment and say, God, are you pleased with the things that I have done in my life? Or, or is this something that you would be pleased with? What I'm about to do or what I have done. I think all of us, no matter how in depth our understanding of scripture or of who God is could probably say no God would not be okay with that action God would not be okay with that sin and and perhaps I do not deserve his goodness and his grace perhaps I deserve God's wrath and anger but no no what does it say God turned that away and instead he comes and he comforts he comes and He comforts. He comes and He offers hope. He offers forgiveness. He offers His mercy. 
and his grace is abundant over us. And that is a promise, my friends. That is a promise, church, that is still very much before us today. That same God in whom Isaiah was speaking to and how he would act and how he would turn from his anger and turn towards a place of comforting us, consoling us, drawing us nearer, bringing us closer. That promise of that God is still before us today. That is the same God who still reigns and is still present among us today. Amen? That we still serve this same good God who comes before us, whose grace is abundant upon us. And so that promise as it is before us gives us great cause to rejoice. Secondly, God is indeed my salvation. He is the source of my salvation. God is the source of our salvation. It it starts there. What is salvation to you? Is salvation important in our lives today? Is salvation important in the lives of others and those whom we seek to reach out to? Are we proclaiming a message of salvation and hope? Are we, are we sharing the message of the good news? The good news that is to come and therefore through the good news it would call us and cause us to rejoice. The good news of a message of deliverance, of freedom, of hope, of goodness, light in the midst of the darkness. God as the source of our salvation is more than enough to call us into a place of rejoicing. It says, I will trust and I won't be afraid. I will trust and I won't be afraid. Oftentimes we choose not to have joy because we do not know what each day may bring. The inconsistencies of life, the fear of life, the doubt that we live with, the uncertainties that we see that flood in all around us and the things that sometimes we choose to embrace more than the things of God. It feeds into that selective attitude and personality and mindset of today. No, not today. I will not choose joy today because today is not going to be the day. Surely today is the day that the Lord has not made. And we cast and we make those judgments. But who are we if not with God? Who are we to make those decisions? Who are we to give give power to those fears that keep us from truly rejoicing? The Apostle Paul, all the time, spent a lot of time in prison. (laughs) He had many opportunities all throughout his ministry to wake up in those dungeons. If you've ever seen the types of prisons that Paul would have spent time in, They were not the prisons and jails that we see today. They are oftentimes dungeons, caves without lights, wet, cold, dangerous environments. And it was from those places that Paul, in the midst of his suffering, would call out, never denying his suffering. And that's important for us to understand when we're trying to cultivate joy in our life. Joy is also not just, hey, turn that frown upside down, put a smile on your face, suck it up. You have life, suck it up. No, joy is also not just that either, though. Paul recognized his suffering many times. He recognized that at times he was even filled with sorrow. But yet, even as he was filled with sorrow, he still rejoiced. He rejoiced because through his ministry, even in the midst of his suffering, the words that he was proclaiming was still impacting and touching others and lives were being saved and the source of salvation that God brings through Jesus Christ was being proclaimed and was being offered to people. That was where his hope was. So they too then were able to live into that hope. They too were then able to live into the promises. So therefore, because it was outside of himself, because it was bigger than him, he was then able to rejoice even in the midst of his sorrowfulness, even in the midst of his suffering. So it's not to say ignore the things that we fear, ignore the things that we struggle with, ignore the things that fill us sometimes with sorrow. Embrace those things. Because if we ignore those things, it's unhealthy. We should never do that. We should always seek out guidance. We should always speak those things out 
into life. Witness to them, testify to them, and share them. More than that, more than the things we fear, trust God, turn to Him, and rejoice. And he will draw, we will draw water with joy from the springs of salvation when we are looking for nourishment, when we are looking to replenish ourselves, our spirits, our souls, when we are looking for guidance and direction, when we are looking for new beginning, when we are looking for renewal, we can go to those places, we can go to those waters, and we can draw, we can draw water with joy from the springs of salvation, knowing that God is always before us. This is why I say joy is an, is an action because it's always paired with things like sing and shout and rejoice, right? Sing to the Lord who has done glorious things. Proclaim this throughout all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, city of Zion, because the Holy One of Israel is great among you. God's greatness, God's goodness is more than enough to shout and rejoice. Amen, church. That's more than enough. That's more than enough. His presence among us is more than enough. Again, regardless of circumstance, God's presence among us and what He is doing and what He is going to do, whether it is in our lifetime or whether it is when we see Him face to face, it is more than enough to rejoice. It is more than enough to rejoice for us. I love uh, Habakkuk 3. 17 through 18. As I said, it does not mean that we need to ignore the things that keep us from rejoicing. But more importantly, it's important for us to recognize the things that God has put before us that we can hope in, the things that He has promised us. And those are the things that we can rejoice in. This is, this is what this says. Verse 17 through 18. I believe we have it on the screen. Though the fig tree doesn't bloom and there's no produce on the vine, though the olive crop withers and the fields don't provide food, though the sheep is cut off from the pen and there is no cattle in the stalls, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my deliverance. Though the fig tree doesn't bloom, though things in our lives don't seem as they're going right, the things that we were hoping to produce have not produced, the things that we were hoping to provide we have not been able to provide, the things that we had hoped to be in the place we ought to be have been cut off at this point in our lives. We've been in this season of life, and it seems like we're just going in circles, even in the midst of all of these things. As the prophet here says, nonetheless, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my deliverance. Because guess what? Deliverance is coming. If it's not today, it is to come in the future. If it's not to come in this life, it is to come in eternity. That is what we believe in in our faith. That is why I say joy is in our faith. If we are not in our faith, then we cannot truly experience God's joy abundantly in our lives. Joy is not based on the circumstance. Joy is based on who God is. God is and what he has done for us and what he is going to do for us. Amen, church? Amen. So I pray that today we can begin to choose joy because you know why? Joy is infectious. Joy is infectious. Have you ever been around a joyful person? It brightens your day. It makes you start forgetting about all the little struggles you got going on in your daily life. The laughter of a child, the laughter of a family gathering around a table, the joy of people just being together. Man, what that does for us. How that can change the mindset and the heart set of an individual in an instant. We have dealt with many infectious things in this season. But none is far more infectious than the joy that is cultivated from the things of God. That is brought 
and given and revealed to us from the things of God. So I pray we may choose joy. So again, firstly, joy's strength is first found in God. We choose joy like we choose love. As God has loved us, He's called us to love Him and to love others. In the same way, we choose joy as God has presented to us joy in the blessings and the promises that He has put before us. And most of all, in His Son, Jesus Christ. And most of all, in the form of His Son, Jesus Christ. Secondly, choose joy by caring for others first. Joy is outward, as I said. It is action. Again, I'm not saying forget about yourself, forget about your well-being, forget about your soul, all that stuff. We're not, we're not saying that. We're not saying that. But I am also saying it is extremely important for true joy to come into one's life is to care about others. To care about others. To care about others who are closest to you. To care about the hope and promises that you want for them to experience in their lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Just as Paul did when he was up in prison. That's what brought him joy was knowing that the people out there, regardless of his circumstance, would hear the good news of Jesus Christ and their lives would be changed and they would experience salvation. And even if they were persecuted, even if they were put to death, that he knew where they were going. He knew of the hope of eternal life. He knew what salvation would bring into life. So that was more than enough for him to rejoice. So therefore, every day that there was an opportunity for those people, the people who would receive his message, would experience these things for them, was a day that the Lord had made. Every day was an opportunity, regardless of the circumstance, for God's goodness, God's hope, and God's promise to be abundant and present in people's lives in the name of Jesus Christ. So joy in our lives comes when we first start caring for others. Think about others and about the impact, the touch, the reach, the legacy that each and every single one of us in this room in faith can leave for others. That will bring great joy into your life in ways that you could have never imagined. That is the joy that we as a church hope to bring. It is a great joy for me to preach before you. As I was coming to church today, I'm just humbled. I'm humbled that I get to stand before you, that you sit there and listen and don't run out of this room. And you put trust and faith that I bring to you a word, that I have faith in who God is and what he has brought before me to bring before you all and to turn to his word. It brings me great joy knowing that you will receive this word and God willing that you'll go out and you'll respond to it. You'll apply it to your life, but most of all, you'll share it with others. That's what brings great joy. And it's humbling. It's humbling. And I pray that you may experience that same joy in your life as well especially in this Advent season and beyond, not just selective, right? Not just for Christmas, but we keep that joy going always. And thirdly, we simply choose joy because Jesus chose joy. Jesus is joy. I always like to say Jesus was the most joyful person to ever to walk this face of the earth, the true joyful person, knowing full well what his mission is, his purpose, and what the end circumstance would be, he still chose joy because of how it would change our lives. And he shared that joy with every single person he encountered. So an example of joy is the life of Christ. And may we live into that daily. Invite the praise band to come forward. Church, joy is about what is to come. This Advent season brings about a great sense of joy because of what it is that we are preparing our hearts for. To remember the coming of our Lord, both now and in the days to come. Joy is is about looking beyond the mush and being hopeful. Being hopeful. Staring down the things that are before us. And being thankful in the small and in the big, whatever it may be. Joy is about believing in God's promises. God's promises for you and for me and for all people. Joy is about the future and what is to come. 
Joy is about hope of salvation and eternal life, even in the midst of death and grief. There's joy. Joy is about God's goodness. God's goodness. The fact that we get to be here this morning together or online. Joy. This is a gift. And I know many of us come into this place perhaps today struggling, hurting, questioning, searching. But you're here. You're here. You got up. And if you're going to get up later, you will get up. Rejoice in that, that gift of life. Joy is about hope and faith, ultimately. So joy is. So whenever we say, ah, man, I'm joyful today. Or that brought me a lot of joy. I pray, I pray that whatever that thing is or whatever that moment is, and I pray it's daily. It's first about who God is in your life. And what he is doing in your life. What he has brought before you. And who you know. And who you know who you are in his eyes. And who he's called you to be. And everything you do may honor and glorify him above all. So choose joy today. Choose joy today. Bring him before him and choose joy. And watch it spread like wildfire throughout your life and the lives of others. Amen, church? Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, God of wonder, God of might, of mercy and love we come before you today choosing joy first rejoicing in who you are as our source of salvation in the name of Jesus Christ trusting in you that regardless of our circumstances regardless of our struggles of our suffering or our moments of sorrow and great defeat that you are still God that you are still before us, that you are in our midst, that you are present always in our lives. For you are the God who has created every day. And because you are the one who has given us every day, regardless of circumstance, may we begin it by first rejoicing. By rejoicing. And then taking that joy and casting it onto others. Recognizing things in our lives, not as something we have to do, but rather something that we get to do. A privilege, a gift, a blessing. In the small and big. Even if life is fast, and life is grand, or if life at times seems mundane, and, and empty, there is joy there. And may we see it. Not because of who we are or because of the judgments we place on ourselves or others, but because of who you are. And for us, in our faith, that has to be enough. You are enough. Your grace is sufficient enough. Your goodness is sufficient enough for us to live with joy in our hearts joy for what is to come even if it has not come yet even if it is something we experience now or in eternity and we have joy joy because of your promises this advent season we can rejoice we can rejoice because of the coming of our lord and savior jesus christ both in the coming days and what we hope for in eternity so may we be a people with great hope and great faith, choose joy this day. And not just sometimes, not just in fleeting moments or because life is always good, but always 
always. May we choose joy. Lord, we praise you this day and we give you thanks for your goodness. It's in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.